Okay. Okay, nice. I'm gonna take a quick break and I'll be back shortly. Sure, that sounds great. Thanks, Vicki. Hey, okay. thank you. Good evening, folks. Thanks for joining us. We'll get started here in a few minutes. Could somebody put in the chat if they can see my intro slide? That would be really helpful. All right. Thanks, Maria. Thanks, Dan. Good to you. I don't know what I did, but couldn't see it, but now you can. I'm glad. Thanks for taking the time this evening to join us. Oh, thanks, Susan. All right, folks. We're going to take this thing live to Facebook. Um, so you might not be able to see my screen for a second, but I hopefully it comes right back. This is really tricky with only one screen. A lot of little tiny windows on a little tiny screen. And um, could I get somebody to tell me in the chat if they can see my screen again? We just went live on Facebook. All right, thanks, Vicki. Oh man, that looks really strange. Sharing the whole thing, but... um. That's all right. It is what it is, and um, we'll get started in a couple minutes. So um, thanks for joining us.
Greetings, everyone. My name is Mark Nutter. I'm the Conservation Programs Director here at New Hampshire Audubon. I'd like to first acknowledge that this presentation is streaming to you from our state headquarters in Concord, New Hampshire, which is the, located within the site of the ancient village of Penacook in Nadakina, which is the traditional ancestral homeland and waterways of the Abenaki, Penacook, and Wabanaki peoples, past and present. I would like to acknowledge and honor with gratitude the land and waterways and our ancestors, the Alnumbach or human beings who have stewarded Nadakina throughout the generations for thousands of years. I invite you to learn more about the indigenous presence on the land you occupy by visiting the website native-land.ca. Here you can see and explore and click on territories of indigenous peoples um, throughout North America and get connected to resources to learn more about those peoples. And for a more in-depth understanding of the Granite State, I invite you to check out all the educational resource resources at indigenousnh.com, including this interactive story map that details the indigenous presence and their stories here in New Hampshire. These resources, among others, have helped me recognize the ongoing consequences of colonialism for all people of color and the need for change in our current society. And thank you again for your interest in tonight's topic, Pollinators 101 with Vicki J. Brown. Vicki was one of our first webinar pioneers last fall when she presented on a garden for wildlife, which really helped us hone in our processes for this entire webinar series. So thank you, Vicki. Uh, as you may know, this talk is the seventh session of a year-long webinar series called Exploring Connections to and Stewardship of the Natural World, supported by the New Hampshire Humanities Council Grant Program. The past of recordings of these excellent talks can be found on the New Hampshire Audubon YouTube page, which are linked on this um, series webpage. And throughout this series, we are exploring the intersection of the sciences and humanities, finding and forging new ways to connect with nature and learn about the importance of conservation action. This particular talk is the third in a series of seven uh, total talks focused on pollinator conservation, and we are super excited to have Vicki back for this topic. However, before I hand it over to Vicki for tonight's presentation, I would like to take this opportunity to briefly describe how this webinar fits within the larger mission of New Hampshire Audubon. So for those of you who don't know, New Hampshire Audubon is a state-based environmental nonprofit organization that's completely independent from National Audubon. We rely on members and donors like you to support our charitable mission, which has four programmatic nature through environmental education experiences like school programs, nature day camp, and webinars like these, researching and conserving species in peril, including large raptors and small birds, managing about 10,000 acres of wildlife sanctuaries throughout the state for habitat and recreation, and finally advocating for sound environmental policy in the New Hampshire State Legislature. I am here today because of donors and members like you. We also rely on a huge network of over 2,000 volunteers that assist us with wildlife monitoring, ambassador animal care, environmental education, and wildlife sanctuary management throughout the state. If you're a volunteer member or supporter of New Hampshire Audubon, I would like to sincerely thank you. We simply couldn't achieve our charitable mission without you. And if you would like to become part of our conservation family, which of course I hope you will, please check out web our website for ways uh, to get involved. Tonight, we have over 75 people registered for this evening. So you'll see that we've gone into full webinar mode. That said, feel free to use the chat function for any thoughts, comments, or reactions you might have during the presentation and the Q&A button specifically for any questions that you'd like Vicki to answer. For fun, try to typing into the chat where you're watching this from. It's been great to see the vast geographies we've been able to reach um, through these webinars. And so that others may engage with you, just change where you're sending the chat message to all panelists and attendees. 
Who knows? You might just meet your neighbor right here in this webinar. And Diane DeLuca, a senior biologist for New Hampshire Audubon, who's also responsible for orchestrating this entire series, uh, is also on the line with us tonight. And her and I will be monitoring both the chat and the Q&A um, to help Vicki answer some of the questions throughout the presentation. I've also set the parameters of the Q&A button so that other attendees can see all the questions that are being asked and can comment or upvote questions that they specifically want answered. I imagine that we'll have plenty of questions, uh, more questions than we have time for. So this process helps us hone in on what questions um, the most people want asked. So without further ado, I would like to introduce this evening's presenter. Vicki J. Brown traded life as a marketing executive in Boston for New Hampshire's woods, waters, and wildlife in 2016. Today, she consults with mission-oriented organi organizations in healthcare and the environment. A founding organizer for Pollinator Pathways, New Hampshire, a New Hampshire natural resources steward, and a covert volunteer, Vicki is slowly turning her lawn into a pollinator and wildlife habitat. She enjoys observing nature while walking, hiking, paddling, and cycling. Please give a warm webinar welcome to Vicki. Thank you, Vicki, for uh, being with us tonight. You're welcome. Thank you, Mark. Uh, thanks, Diane. Thanks to New Hampshire Audubon for putting this fantastic series together, evolving or sorry, exploring connections and this uh, pollinator series within it. It's really exciting. Delighted to be here and really happy to see you um, in the audience. And I'm looking forward to exploring some of those connections with pollinators um, by sharing some of the connections I have. Um, let me share first why I'm here. Um, I la had to laugh a little when uh, Mark said, I'm slowly turning the lawn into pollinator habitat. That is a slow process, <laughs> um, especially when you have as many invasives um, and they are the big woody ones like autumn olive, um, which we spent the entire past weekend getting rid of, but um, progress is being made. So the reason I'm here is because of birds, actually. It, it boils down to um, me understanding that um, my landscape, the two acres that I have, really um, is part of an overall system that um, requires insects and pollinators. And so that's why I'm here with you today is to sort of share as a, an amateur naturalist, um, unlike the other speakers in the pollinator series, I don't have a degree in biology. A minor doesn't count, I don't think. And I'm not an expert on bees, moths, um, butterflies, etc. But I have a lot of really interesting everyday knowledge to share in this Pollinators 101. The bird that I talked about is the chickadee, the Carolina chickadee. And black cat chickadee is our native chickadee. And some of you know the story that it's because of that bird that I really became interested in insects and pollinators and have learned so much about them. It turns out that um, the parents of the chickadees are very good parents. Mom and dad go back and forth shuttling to the nest, literally, um, every three minutes with another caterpillar for the nestlings. And they do that every three minutes and they do that all day long, starting at 6 a.m. and going until 8 p.m. And that's a 14 hour process. Um, so in a day, that means that they are bringing back, um, you know, 14 times 25 to 40 caterpillars. They're bringing back 350 to 570 caterpillars a day and multiply that out by the time that the nestlings are in the nest before they actually leave, 16 or 18 days on average for a chickadee. And then we're talking about 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars. So I'd like to ask you the question I asked myself, can your yard support a single chickadee nest? That's the question that got me started on this pathway. And that's why I'm here with you tonight. So I'm going to, there we go. So the discussion is very simple. It's a pollinators 101. I'm gonna share with you some of the everyday pollinators that you're likely to see in your yard, in your landscape, in your garden, um, based on my experiences as a homeowner doing this. We'll talk about why pollinators matter and how you can help. 
and we can help. We can actually help pollinators thrive. So what I'd like to do is actually start with a quick poll. And Mark's gonna launch a poll and it's four questions. And it's kind of like the three truths and a lie. If you've ever done that wonderful um, icebreaker activity where you say three things that are true about yourself and one that's false, um, there's four questions here. So please take a moment and answer if you think it's true or false, each one of these questions. The first one is only bees and butterflies are pollinators, true or false. The second is monarch butterflies fly all the way north each season, true or false. Third, wasps evolved from bees. How many of you have thought about that one? <laughs> And lastly, um, both sexes of bees, male and females, both have stingers, true or false. Now, while you're answering that, um, I will tell you that I cheated a little and it isn't three truths and a lie. It's actually more lies. <laughs> so um, if you're looking at these saying, geez, I don't actually think all of these, so many of these are true. Well, you're right. How's it looking there, Mark? And we have 70 people so far voted, 77 people. Let's get to at least 90, 80%, nice. A few more people. Um, it's really fun watching the, the answers come in. Um, this well, first question has all, all false responses. Excellent, so well then it could everybody- be good or it could be bad, I'm not really I, sure. Expert. I think that's good. Um, the answer to number one is false. You know, while we're waiting for everyone to answer the other ones, there are several types of pollinators and we'll be talking about um, many of those types. So um, every one of you got this right, um, that bees and butterflies are not the only pollinators. There is actually five other types in New Hampshire and New England. And in the world, there's um, an eighth type. Um, so there's a total of seven in New England and eight in the world. I'll talk about those today. Um, the second question um, stumped folks, uh, monarch butterflies fly all the way north each season. That was a tricky one. Um, monarch butterflies do not fly all the way north in the season. They fly all the way south in the season. That's one generation. But um, the monarch butterflies take between four and six generations to fly all the way north. When they're starting down in Mexico or in California, it's four generations, sometimes as many as six. Um, wasps evolved from bees. Um, so uh, everybody, the majority here are accurate. Um, it is a false. Um, in fact, it's the opposite. Bees evolved from wasps. The thinking is that wasps, which were the hunting wasps, which were predatory, which were provisioning their, uh, their nests for their eggs and their larvae with insects, they got a taste for nectar. And not surprisingly, they decided to become vegetarians. <laughs> so hence all the bees. And then lastly, both male and female bees have stingers. And the reality is um, the answer to this one is also false. So all four of these are false. Um, both male and females do not have stingers. Because they evolved from wasps, it's similar with wasps. Only the females have stingers. Same with mosquitoes too. Only the females can sting you. They just don't, males just don't have the equipment. They can't physically do it. So thank you very much for sharing that, Mark. And thanks everyone for participating. That was fun. All right. So we can't talk about pollinators without talking about pollination. And I'm not gonna um, I'm not gonna go over the the 12 different terms of pollination that always confuse us all. <laughs> I'm gonna keep it really simple, but it's a, um, a really important concept. And pollination is essentially the reproduction of plants. So it's basically the sexual reproduction of plants. It's how they reproduce. It's how they create seeds and the fruit and the nuts that we love and that animals love. So in simple terms, an animal or the wind or um, even a human actually gets the pollen, which is the male part. And that's usually little grains, little tiny yellow things like you see pictured here and moves it to another flower, sometimes on a different plant, sometimes on the same plant, sometimes it's the same flower. Um, if it's self-pollinating, that pollen goes over to another flower and it goes to the female reproductive part, uh, which is the ovary represented here in green and the, and the egg or the seed basically gets fertilized and you thereby get the seed. So looking at this in real life, let me share a real flower. I find it really helpful to look at a real thing. So this is one of my favorite flowers. This is the native honeysuckle. 
And if you see the outside petals um, that are either yellow on the inside and red on the outside, that in the, uh, in the honeysuckle, that's actually a fused sepal in petal. But you don't really need to know that for the purposes of pollination. The things that are in yellow here um, are the pollen. And the pollen is on um, an anther. It's basically a little filament, okay? And then the female part is called the stigma and it is sticky. And so you remember sticky stigma, that is where the pollen will be deposited and it's sticky so that those little granules will stick to it. And when that happens, then you can have, basically it will fertilize the, uh, you know, and you'll get the seed. So that is it. You can see the stigma in the other flower here. Whenever you look at a flower, see if you can identify the pollen versus the sticky part, which is the female part. And you'll see different flowers have them arranged differently, but it's really fascinating when you start looking at it that way. So I hope that's helpful as a starting point. And now I'd like to start talking about the seven types of pollinators. So most of us are well aware of the honeybee being the probably most recognizable and well-known pollinator. And the honeybee on this water lily is actually a, an animal that is not native to the United States, it came from Europe and Africa. So we have honeybees all over the world now. And they're one of our farm animals, actually. We literally use them to pollinate our crops. And we, in the spring every year, move millions of honeybees and their hives to California to pollinate the almond crop. And then those bees get moved to other parts of the country as different um, other crops need pollinating. So honeybees are really important to ensure that we have the massive amounts of uh, crops pollinated at once that we have. Our native bees, there's just not enough of them to do the, you know, en masse almond groves, for example. So honeybees are one type of bee, but in the United States, we have our own bees that are native to us that are wild in the US. And there's actually, believe it or not, 4,000 species of native bees in the United States. And about 400 of those are in New England. So one of the most recognizable ones probably is the Eastern common bumblebee. It's here on um, a milkweed flower. And the bumblebee is pretty recognizable as being kind of fuzzy and furry, um, bumbling about. It does something called um, um, buzz pollination. And um, if you've ever seen it, I have some videos of a bumblebee in a flower and it literally goes zzz, zzz, zzz. Um, it's very fun. This is a bumblebee on Joe pie weed in my garden. Um, basically, bees of all types really like tall, spiky things. And they tend to favor purple um, because they actually have a visibility in the color range that's different than ours. They see a lot of UV. So that means they see a lot of the purples in the spectrum that we can't visibly see. So many flowers actually have on their petals, they actually have guidelines or nectar lines. Many, of many times we can't see it. You may notice it on, you can see it on tulips, you can see it on our native spring beauty. You can, we can physically see it, but what a bee sees in a flower is very, very different than what we see. So besides bumblebees, um, which I love to call the teddy bears of the bee world because they're fuzzy and cute, we also have um, the carpenter bees. Uh, the, this Eastern carpenter bee actually is um, the largest bee in the United States. Um, and it is very similar to a bumblebee in terms of its size and how it bumbles around. However, there's one big difference um, in terms of it looking at it visually. This is on some fabric actually on my grill cover. Um, this bumblebee um, queen was, um, sorry, this carpenter bee queen was um, very interested in the grill cover for some reason before it started drilling a hole in my deck. Um, this particular bee has a shiny abdomen. So the third part or the third segment of a carpenter bee is always shiny, does not have the, the hair or the fur on it that you see on a bumblebee. So if you see a shiny butt, you know that it's a carpenter bee and not a bumblebee. So let's talk about another really interesting type of native bee. There's this category of sweat bees. There's the green sweat bees, there's the metallic green sweat bees. And we have two species represented here on coneflower, Echinacea purpurea. On the left is um, a species that is all green on all three body segments. And on the right, we have a different species, um, females that are gathering pollen. 
that um, have green on their head and their thorax, but not on their abdomen. The abdomen, as you can see, is nicely striped black and white. It turns out that these bees on the right are um, a type of bee called Agapostamon, and it's called Agapostamon viricens. And these are females very heavily laden with pollen that they're gathering from this flower. And they will be going back to their nest and they're gonna use this pollen to provision the egg that's in there so that when the egg hatches, the larva will have a nice pollen store to eat. And I really enjoy watching these bees. These particular bees are ground nesting bees. And I discovered them last year in a failed patch of, believe it or not, mint. I had mint that did not thrive, but the benefit was, you see the, the mint in the background looks terrible. The benefit was that I got these bees. And by the way, it turns out the bees were there because I had planted wild strawberry and they liked that. I'm gonna show a video here, a very short video. I'd like you to watch the right side of your screen and you will see the female. I have this in slow motion, slowed down by three times, the female without much pollen going into her little hole. I'm gonna do that again so that you can see it. I think it's really interesting how it kind of sways. Um, before they get to this point, they're actually above and they, they really do a quite a big zigzag maneuver uh, to try to avoid predation. Um, this particular female is going into a hole um, in which there are other females, but these are not social insects. So most bees are not social. They are not like honeybees and don't have a big hive. Bumblebees do, but most bees do not. Most bees are solitary and they nest on their own, but they may nest together. So what does that mean? That means in this case, this particular hole is being used by a few females. So a few females will use the hole, but they each, they each dig their own cavity and a nest, you know, in this, a tunnel in the soil, if you will, into which they're depositing their eggs and the pollen. So it's really fun when you find one of these to sit there and very, be very still and watch as the bees get ready to come out. You see the antenna emerge and they kind of look around. If they see any movement or any danger, they retreat. But when they're ready and they come out, um, it's really a really fun thing to do. So those are the sweat bees. And then at the end of the season, there's a lot of bees that um, basically are sleeping in flowers. So this is a fleabane flower, and that's a tiny flower. Fleabanes are mm, maybe not quite an inch. Um, so this is a pretty tiny bee I, I found early one morning. And here they are again. And these are what we call, um, they have long antenna. Um, so we call them long horned for a long antenna. Um, I haven't been able to positively identify which species this is, but we know that they're male. And um, they're basically um, not in, you know, they're not in a nest. They sleep overnight in their flowers and they get up in the morning and they go about their business of collecting nectar for energy. And um, once they, you know, reproduce, they, that's their main goal. That's their main role is to uh, mate, with a, mate with a queen. So those are the really cute bees. There's so many different kinds of bees to see. Um, I have a very tiny one that's ground that's a, in a ground nest um, on my front in my front path actually that I discovered this year. And they're much smaller than the the agapostamin that I showed you. Um, and it's worth noting that for bees, they have two places they might nest. Seventy percent of our native bees are ground nesters, and the other thirty percent are nesting in cavities. So what you saw was a ground nest and those that are in cavities, they might have, they might be using a beetle hole that's in an old log or tree, a standing dead tree. They might be, um, they might be using a hole or a cavity that already exists perhaps in a cane of a raspberry or a blackberry, right? Um, or they can even excavate pith from some of our perennial stems. So this is one of the reasons why we recommend not cutting down your perennials in the fall but leaving them standing because it does provide not only an overwintering site, but you may actually even have, you know, larva from next year that would be emerging in the spring as well as potential queens. So that's a quick review of bees, the first category of pollinators. Let's move to the second category. We all know about butterflies and we all love the monarch. This is a monarch on swamp milkweed. And you're gonna see swamp milkweed a lot in my presentation because it just seemed to attract a lot of different pollinators. So 
This male is on a um, swamp milkweed, and as we know, monarchs um, just eat milkweed as caterpillars. This is a lovely tiger swallowtail. Um, I don't know if it's an Eastern or a tiger swallowtail, they look very similar, but note the tail at the bottom on the hind wing as these little tails, that's why it's called a swallowtail. That'll help you in IDing butterflies in the future, hopefully. Um, this one is a Harris checker spot. This one I just found yesterday when I was a walk, you know, on a walk in um, Lynn Woods in Mass. And um, I was really excited to see this. I'm not sure I have seen one before. It's a spice bush swallowtail. And the spice bush swallowtail caterpillars have to have spice bush to eat, just like monarchs need milkweed. This is a clouded sulfur, also on the um, Echinacea purpurea, the cone flower. This is an um, Atlantis fritillary. There's a couple of different fritillaries, um, but this I believe is an Atlantis fritillary, really pretty. And they're kind of similar looking to some of the crescents like the pearl crescent. So you have to get a good picture and try to key it out. On the Echinacea purpurea here, we have a common buckeye butterfly. Again, this is in my yard. And then here, um, the last butterfly I just wanted to share with you is, uh, has a couple of common names, um, red spotted admiral, because you can see the red spots there, or white admiral. Um, so butterflies are very important pollinators. We love our butterflies. We love them as adults. There's about 139 species of butterflies in New Hampshire, according to New Hampshire Fish and Game. So 139 species of butterflies. I've only shown you about six or seven. And butterflies are interesting in that when they land on a flower, they, they basically are on a flower with very long, thin legs. And on that flower, they're using their proboscis to basically reach down and get in and get the nectar. Um, and they don't have as much fur on their bodies um, and they're not collecting pollen. As a result, butterflies are not terribly efficient pollinators. They do do pollination services, but bees are far more efficient um, than butterflies are. So let's move to the third category, which is moths. This is a hummingbird moth or clear wing moth or snowberry moth. And when you first see it, you might think it's a hummingbird because it acts like a hummingbird. It hovers and it goes backwards, it stays still. Um, but the, the, the dead giveaway is if you take a look at the antenna, that's clearly you know, not a bird. Um, um, it's, not a, it's not a hummingbird, it's, it's a moth. And most of our moths are nocturnal. And um, they probably don't get the credit that they deserve for pollination. Um, Diane and I were just talking about that earlier before we started today. So the hummingbird moth here is a daytime flyer. And there are a few others, which I'm gonna share with you that you'll see during the day. Um, they are very important pollinators. There are 2,200 species of moths in New Hampshire, 2,200. Remember I said there are only 139 butterfly species. And so who knew? I didn't know this a few years ago either. There's 15 times more species of moths than there are butterflies. So they are responsible for a significant amount of poll pollination at night. Most of them are doing it at night. We don't see them. Um, they tend to be very drab in color. Um, you don't see them during the day because they're camouflaged against tree bark, against leaf litter, et cetera. Um, but they are very important pollinators. So I wanna share a couple of other moths that I think you might see during the day because I've seen them. One of my favorites is this one. It's the evening primrose moth. So called not because it's on the evening primrose, but because it's caterpillar at, in its caterpillar stage actually eats the buds of the flower of the evening primrose. So it's basically its host plant is evening primrose. But interestingly, the adult has an affinity for the evening primrose too. Take a look at this. That's the moth with its head stuck inside the flower. And I saw this on the evening primrose very early in the morning as the primrose was starting to close up because primroses are open at night like many white flowers are and it closes during the day. And the moths basically take refuge, probably is a good place to stay away from predators inside of that closed flower. And when the flower opens up again, it can fly out. I have, I have seen as many as two of these inside of a flower um, together at once. So pretty cool. Here's another really interesting moth that um, has very bright colors. It is called 
be yellow and black or black and yellow lichen moth. Um, it will also be, instead of yellow, you can sometimes see it in orange, bright orange, and it has kind of striking uh, dark blue legs. So when you see this thing, you're kind of like, what the heck's this? It's a little bit scary at first. And that's what's interesting about it. One of the interesting things about it is that it is a mimic, which a lot of um, insects are mimics of other things to try to prevent predation. It's a mimic of a beetle that's poisonous. So its colors warn predators away and save it from being eaten. The other thing I wanna share about this moth is the black and yellow lichen moth is so named because in, in its larval stage, the caterpillars eat lichen. So lichen is the host plant for this black and yellow, um, or yellow and black lichen moth. Isn't that interesting? Here is a caterpillar on my cardinal flower, and it is actually sticking straight up <laughs> on that flower petal. Um, it's one of the pug moths. Um, it's a whole category of pug moths, uh, many of which look like sticks. Um, you'll see them sticking up on trees and they look like a stick unless you look closely. Well, you know, this particular caterpillar is probably using the cardinal flower as a host plant as well, meaning it needs it for its food. So this concept of a host plant um, as food for the caterpillars is really pretty important. Caterpillar food is host plants. Here you have a monarch caterpillar, which we all know requires milkweed. They have evolved over zillions of years, not a technical term, but they've evolved over time to only be able to eat milkweed. And most insects cannot eat milkweed because milkweed, like other plants, has its own defenses to make it taste bad or to make it unpalatable or to even make it you know, potentially lethal for whatever tries to eat it. So there's an arms race between caterpillars and plants and caterpillars have had to evolve to specialize on a particular plant so that they are able to digest it and um, use it to get to the adult stage. So pretty much all of the moth and butterfly species have this kind of host specificity and require a specific plant that they have evolved with over time. The two examples I want to share now are the swallowtail caterpillar here on the left. The swallowtail caterpillar requires um, Zizia aurea or uh, golden alexander, which is in the family with parsley and dill and fennel. So that entire family of plants, this particular caterpillar can eat, and you may have seen it on your parsley, for example. The one on the right, this is a hickory tussock moth, and the hickory tussock moth uses, guess what, as its host plant. As a caterpillar, it requires hickory. So host plants are really, really important, and I'd like to share that research that's been done by experts in the field actually counting the number of species of caterpillar on trees shows that trees are actually the most important thing that you can do in your landscape to support pollinators. Um, flowers are really important for the adults, but if you don't have the larva and the babies, you're not gonna have the adults. So I wanna share the top four species, top five species really of trees with you, um, based on research by Doug Tallamy and Desiree Narango. Um, they basically have determined that an oak tree, the oak species in general, in, the, in North America will support 534 species of moths and butterflies, again, in the caterpillar stage, over 500. Isn't that truly incredible? Willows, which are a very important source of um, early uh, nectar and pollen for our early, early bees, early native bees. Willow has 456 caterpillars that can eat it and require it as their host. Cherries and plums, which are all in the Rosaceae family, they also will together support 456 species. And lastly, I wanna mention our, our, our birches, our native birches, 413 species of caterpillar. Now, going back to my story at the beginning about birds, if we don't have caterpillars, we don't have birds. You have to have a lot of caterpillars in order to feed a single nest of birds. Um, they happen to have, they happen to be a perfect package of protein and other things that you know, a baby needs and they're soft bodied. So it's easy for mom and dad to stuff it down their throat. So 
Um, so if you plant trees, if you have trees there, that's great. Shrubs are also really important. Milkweed's important for monarchs. You know, even things like blueberry are really critical and raspberry, you know, things that are in our landscape all support a hundred different species of moths and butterflies. So, so since we're talking about caterpillars and I'm waxing poetically about them, I wanna share a, two great resources actually about caterpillars. If you are inclined to learn more, if you start seeing caterpillars, go to the Caterpillar Lab. They have a great online presence. They have a great physical presence, which is now open again, that you can visit and actually see um, the caterpillars. You can see pupa, you can see them hatching. You can see the parasites um, and all the evolving ecological relationships that caterpillars have with parasite, um, um, predatory wasps and other things that might parasitize these that are all important part of the ecosystem. Um, there's also the Portsmouth Caterpillar Club, which you can join on Facebook if you want to learn about caterpillars. And lastly, really strong recommendation. If you are finding that you're seeing caterpillars and you want to learn what they are, use iNaturalist, which is an app, also a desktop application. You basically take a photo um, and you'll learn which, which features will help you discern. But take as good a clear photo as you can and put it up there and it will automatically, the application will come back with recommendations or suggestions. And then you can contribute it to this big user generated database. And people who are experts in the field, bee experts, caterpillar experts will say, yes, that's what it is or no, it's actually this. So it's a really great resource. I strongly encourage you to check it out. So we've talked about three of the types of pollinators and I'd like to pause for a moment and ask Diane if we have any questions coming in from the Q&A that I can answer or try to answer. Vicki, I don't see any questions right now. If people want to um, put questions in. Um, I was just curious about the species of bees that you shared out and how early some of them are when they emerge from their nests and what kinds of plants they might need at that point? Yeah, that's a really good question, Diane. And um, it's, uh, it, it varies. Uh, the bees actually, many of the bees were finding the research that's being done by Heather Holm and others is, and, and Robert Jajir, who's one of the speakers in this series, is showing that, that bees specialize on certain plants too. Um, we have our specialist uh, our, our generalist bees that can basically, you know, use anything. And then a lot of them are specialists. So early in the season, um, I'll talk a little bit about this later, but early in the season, what's really important are the flowering red maples and the flowering willows that are providing them with food. Right now, um, I don't have the bee that I showed you in the video. They're not up yet. <laughs> They're still in their little burrows, but the bee that's on my front porch, which is a, which is a different type of bee, it actually is feeding on my um, golden Alexander. I've seen them over there pulling that up because golden Alexanders are flowering around the same time as dandelions and it's a great native. And I planted it specifically to help the swallowtail butterflies. So basically it's very important to have the, the forage that they need when they're coming out. And many times the bees that are looking for their first you know, nest to provision a nest because they need the food, they will make their nest close to the source of food. So in the case of those agapostamen, they were using, unbeknownst to me, the newly planted wild strawberry that I was using as a ground cover, they were using that for their pollen before I ever noticed that they were there. So that um, leads us to another question here. How late should I wait into the spring to clean up my garden beds? Okay, so that is a, a question that I feel like the science keeps giving us more and more information. Um, so we used to say, don't cut down your stems, um, your perennial stems until you've had five degrees of at least 50 degrees weather day and night. It's really dependent upon the temperature of the soil, but we're not probably gonna get a thermometer and measure the soil <laughs> temperature. But um, that's when bees know when to emerge, wherever they are at, if it's the right temperature, um, the ones in the ground um, seem to be based on that. Um, I actually am of the opinion that now that we should not be 
cutting down our perennial stems at any time. I can tell you from personal experience that leaving my swamp milkweed stems up has served so many more purposes than I ever could have imagined. Not just nesting overwintering bees, but I've seen two species of birds, both the Baltimore Oriole and the Chipping Sparrow, pulling fibers from the swamp milkweed of last year to make their nests. I have seen the rabbits not actually eat the swamp milkweed because they do eat this, the milkweed in my yard. They break it, cut it down, and then two days later come back and eat the whole thing. They won't, they can't get at it because that's there. So there are so many reasons to actually leave them up. And it's that is actually right on my front path. And um, I'm not worried about how that looks because the, the leaves are growing up, the stems are growing up around that. And it is providing a very important ecological function as I'm learning. Um, as far as cleanup in other ways, um, I like the words of one of my natural resources instructors. Instead of tidying up, think about tucking your garden in. So think about, you know, trying to create as little disturbance as possible in your wild areas, because that's where animals are overwintering, they're nesting, they're living, they're sheltering, they're finding food. Try to um, keep those areas undisturbed and, um, you know, keep that as an important part of your environment as you're bringing nature in. Um, and uh, just tuck things, if you wanna make it look nice in the front of the house, tuck things underneath the, the, the bushes or underneath the garden bed. And as Doug Tallamy says, if you're feeling like, um, well, I don't have enough areas to tuck the leaves in to tidy it up, as Doug would say, exactly. You need more garden beds. <laughs> Thanks, Vicki. That's actually really great advice. So now there are a couple of questions that are specific to certain species. So. I'll share out this one. Mid-coast and southern Maine areas are having trouble with the brown tail moth caterpillar. Do you know if it's spreading to New Hampshire? I do not know. I have heard that's the one that actually um, hurts or it causes terrible itching for people in Maine. I have not heard that it is here. I don't know, Diane, have you heard? I have not heard that it's gotten to southern, New, um, even to very southern Maine. So I don't know that it's in New Hampshire. It's very specific to certain areas mm. and they tend to be coastal. Mm. What I would recommend yeah. if you wanna see if that species is near you, um, I did this tonight to actually look up the, uh, the actual locations of one of our endangered bees. Go to iNaturalist, type it in, um, and you can actually ask for, you can, you can set the geographic range of New Hampshire and you can see if there's been any observations of that particular species. And you'll know right away if it's in New Hampshire or not. Great idea. So there, so there's a question about are carpenter bees a structural problem for the home? Yeah, I get that question a lot. I wish I had a good answer for it. I can tell you, I've had my first experience this year. Um, they are not like termites. They're not like carpenter ants. They are not going to destroy your home. They are going to create a tunnel. They're gonna basically you know, do a perfectly round, amazing hole. And they're gonna create a tube, basically a tunnel in the wood in which they're going to, you know, deposit their eggs and put in the pollen, you know, for the, uh, for their babies. Um, I'm just going to watch them uh, because they don't do a heck of a lot of damage. Um, if you don't want them there, when they start that hole, just plug it up. It's just like any, any animal that's getting into your house that you don't want around. Exclusion. Figure out a way to basically prevent them from going in there. And, uh, you know, painting and, you know, staining your wood is often the best way to prevent them from doing that. Another great way I have learned, and it makes sense, provide other places for them to make the holes. Leave the dead standing wood in the wild part of your yard. Um, let this, the dead standing tree be there. Put, you know, plant a log in a spot um, so that they can take a little, put a little hole in there instead of doing it on your house or your deck or your railing in my case. <laughs> So I think um, we'll move on to the other four pollinators now, if that's okay, Diane? Yeah, sounds good. Okay, so we're talking about three. Let's talk about the fourth one. And this is the one that's much disparaged, the wasps. Yes, wasps are pollinators. Remember the bees are descended from the wasps. They have a taste for nectar. They need nectar for energy, for fuel, right? This is a scary looking guy. And this is a guy, no stinger, right? This is the great golden digger wasp. And it's about an inch. And when you first see it, it kind of freaks you out because it's really looks big, looks kind of scary. 
these guys will be flying around my swamp milkweed and they're totally, totally not interested in you. All they're doing in the cases of the females, they're basically trying to provision the nest for their babies. So they're just focused on that, that's it. And they're not gonna bother you unless you truly threaten them by squishing them or something or swatting at them or you know if they get caught in your clothes and you squish them. But they are uh, fascinating to watch. I've actually seen one digging, it's they're ground nesting too, like 70% of the bees, 70% of wasps are ground nesting. They will dig a hole and basically, you know, dig out the little burrow. It's really fascinating to watch them do that. Um, so wasps are not gathering pollen for their babies. They are gathering other insects and they're paralyzing those insects and they're bringing them back to the burrow and they're depositing them in there with an egg. So when that egg hatches, the larva actually has food to eat. Here's another image of that great golden digger wasp um, from a gentleman in Florida that I got from Creative Commons. So you can kind of see the head. Again, it's got quite the, you know, it's got quite the, the hairs and looks kind of scary, but it is not and it will not harm you. So please take a moment if you see it and, and watch it and I think you'll, you'll enjoy it. Um, so like I mentioned, wasps are like bees, most often ground nesters we do have problematic wasps that are social. So these are solitary. And again, they're not defending a hive. They're not defending a big nest. A bald-faced hornet is a social insect, has a huge nest. And if you disturb that, they might attack. Yellow jackets also. The number of wasps that are dangerous to us or annoying or aggressive when they're really defending their territory are few relative to the wide number of species of wasps. Uh, I would encourage you to sign up for the uh, upcoming webinar on wasps and watch, um, watch one by Heather Holm to learn more. So the fifth species or fish, fifth group of pollinators are the beetles. So this is actually an Eastern firefly or lightning bug. So you probably know that Eastern fireflies, fireflies are not actually flies, they're beetles. You can kind of see that they have the shell there. And this is also on my swamp milkweed. I actually saw a lot of fireflies during the day. They're actually easier to spot and catch during the day than they are at night when they're flashing. So um, Eastern fireflies are one type of beetle um, that you know are pollinators, which is really pretty neat. I also want to share the fact that there are a lot of beetles that we call flower beetles. I did a search on iNaturalist um, and just put in flower beetles and you can see there's many different kinds of flower beetles. So you're not going to see very many of them necessarily unless you're out in the garden a lot, but you can see that they are very important as pollinators. And in fact, they're some of the oldest, perhaps the oldest pollinators. Um, they evolved at the time with the big, big cupped flowers, magnolias and such. Beetles are very important pollinators for magnolia and other types of um, flowers. So this is a, a goldenrod soldier beetle. And the goldenrod soldier beetle is actually quite common to see in the, in the late summer in areas of goldenrod, as you would expect, because that's what it's called. So here, um, I believe this was um, August timeframe. These are two goldenrod social beater, uh, soldier beetles together on goldenrod. Um, they like the composite flowers um, and they are very active. Um, and you basically can't go into a goldenrod area at the right time of year. And again, you can check iNaturalist and it'll also tell you um, the frequency of observations by month, which will also help you to know when to find something. They're very, very common. You'll see them. Fascinating to see them and completely harmless to watch. Here we have another beetle. And this one is really cute and tiny. It is so tiny. It's maybe two millimeters in size. And it's called the common pollen beetle. And it basically is in the inside of the cup of a little flower. I don't think it was a spring beauty, but it was another um, native, early native flower. Um, I don't remember which one. And it's very, very tiny. And at that time when I saw this one, they seemed this, this particular pollen beetle, this type, the species seemed to be in all of the flowers at the same time. And I'm gonna end the beetles section with my favorite beetle that I discovered, this is a bumble flower beetle, bumble flower beetle, because it's mimicking a bumblebee. 
it's a beetle because it has a shell and everything. It has all the characteristics of the antenna, but it's hairy like a bumblebee. So this is a really a very pretty interesting um, little critter um, as many of these folks are. So that's beetles. All right. So why don't we move on to the next category of pollinators and that is the flies. Yes, flies are pollinators. And this is actually a fly. You may look at it first and think it's a bee. And in fact, this category of flies are known as bee mimics. They are mimicking bees on purpose. They've evolved that way as a strategy um, to avoid predation. Now you can tell it's a fly for a few reasons. One is if you take a look at its head, the eyes, and it's not a very clear picture, but the eyes of a fly are much larger and tend to cover the entire head and often meet right in the middle, the compound eyes, whereas a bee's eyes are elliptical in shape and like almost like a flying saucer and they're on the side of the head and they don't meet and they're much smaller in size as, it, as, as a proportion of the overall head. The other way you can tell it's a fly when you're looking at um, a species that you don't know is the number of wings. So a fly only has one pair or two wings and a bee and a wasp actually has two pairs or four wings. That's another way you can tell. So I have to look at my notes for which calligrapher fly. This is a marginal, um, marginal calligrapher fly and I'll show you a different one in a moment. There's a lot of different ones. Um, this particular fly that I showed you is in the Searfid family. Um, they're also known as flower flies or hover flies. They will hover in the same spot. So if you see something doing that, that's not a bee, it's probably a hover fly. And you can see just like beetles, there's a massive number of different kinds of flies that are pollinating flowers, right? This is, um, this is a, a, a type of fly as well. Um, I wasn't able to identify specifically what kind it was, but it's extremely small and delicate looking. It's got these really long legs. Um, it's a type of flower fly. And this is another one of these um, calligrapher flies, like the first one I showed you. you. See the abdomen has that kind of stripey thing, but not striped all the way across like most bees. It's got the two wings and it's got the big eyes. This one is a maize calligrapher uh, fly. And this one actually landed on a cup. So it's on the lid of a cup right there. It's not on the flower. <laughs> And the last fly I wanna show you is a, is a really interesting little creature. This one is called the bee fly. And it's a genus called the Villa genus. And um, they're imitating bees as well. I think you can tell which bee it's trying to imitate. It looks like it's trying to be a bumblebee because it's got the, the furry hair on it, but it's not. Note the big eyes, note the two wings versus the four. So that's definitely a fly. And this one's, an interesting one because it's a parasite. So like our cuckoo birds or our brown-headed cowbirds, it doesn't actually provision the nest for its young. It uses other provisions and other nests instead. So I encountered these, these guys on, you know, one day, a bunch of them flying around and they weren't going into any holes. They were acting very oddly and I couldn't figure out what they were doing. It turns out they were waiting for bees to leave, ground nesting bees to leave their nest, leave the hole. And then when they did, they would hover over and they would flick their abdomen and drop an egg, hopefully into the hole and then leave. And then what happens is that egg hatches. If it's in the hole, it goes and it eats the nice pollen stores that the bee left. So the fly larva is eating the bee pollen. And then when it's consumed the pollen, the larva will then continue to actually consume the egg or the larva of the bee that's in there. So it'll not only eat the, the, uh, the pollen, but it'll also actually eat the bee. And then it stays there and it pupates and then it emerges as an adult in the spring. So that's, that's all part of nature. It's one of the ecological connections that's important. You know, all the, every niche in nature is filled in some way. So I want to talk about the seventh category of New England pollinators, and that is the birds. And in New Hampshire and New England, we have one hummingbird. This is the ruby-throated hummingbird. This is the male. You can tell from the dark throat, which in the right situation will be bright red. It's on scarlet bee balm here, and um, they love the long tubular flowers, and I call them, um, you know, winged jewels. 
This is the female hummingbird who last year, I think practically lived in my honeysuckle. This is a native honeysuckle vine that I got, you know, was maybe 18 inches tall or a foot tall when I got it. And after three years, I had trellised it up to about 12 feet. So up above that is our deck and at dinner time, we watch the hummingbirds eat while we eat. Um, this particular female um, has her beak open. I don't know if you can see that, her beak is open slightly and she was sticking her tongue out. Her tongue is much, much longer than the beak. I used to think that the beak was, you know, basically and the tongue went into the tubular flowers and that's basically the depth that it went to. But the reality is that the tongue is much longer than the beak. Um, in fact, it's quite long and doesn't fit inside the mouth. So where does that tongue go? I'll give you a hint. It's similar to the woodpecker tongue. So woodpeckers, you probably know, have very, very long tongues as well, and it's too long to fit inside their mouth. So they wrap their tongue around their skull. You actually can see diagrams, um, Google it. You'll see diagrams of the tongue and how it wraps around the skull because it is so long. Hummingbirds do the same kind of thing. They have evolved so that that tongue is tucked away nicely around the skull and they don't need it. And then it moves quite rapidly and it actually, it actually goes out into the nectar and so fast we can't see it, of course. It goes out into the nectar, splits into two pieces, kind of suctions up the nectar and goes back in and out. And it does it at such a rapid rate. It's pretty amazing. So that's a quick fun fact about um, our lovely local hummingbirds. So I've talked about the seven types of pollinators that we have in New England, bees and butterflies and moths and wasps and beetles and flies and hummingbirds. But there's one more very important pollinator we don't have in New England that I wanna to touch on and that is bats. Bats are extremely important in the West, um, in the Southwest in particular, um, as a means of pollinating cactus, for example, the saguaro cactus, cactus. They're also extremely important in the tropics. We have bats in New Hampshire, but they are not frugivores. They are insectivores. So they're eating insects, but they are not feeding on, on plants and therefore they're not pollinating the same way that the bats are um, in the tropics and in the Southwest. So bats are very important pollinators too. So that's a quick one through of the different types of pollinators. And I'd like to do one more poll question um, that um, Mark is gonna put up and ask you now of the eight types of animals that I just talked about, um, of which six are invertebrates and two are vertebrates being the birds and the bats, which animal actually pollinates the most plants? Now, this isn't the question of which is the best pollinator, which I often get. And I won't answer that question because every animal is important. There is no best. <laughs> every, every pollinator is critical in its ecosystem. So if you could answer the question of which animal pollinates the most plants in terms of volume for us, you know, both here and in the world, is it bats or beetles, bees, butterflies, flies, hummingbirds, moths, or wasps? And you'll see we put it in alphabetical order here so as not to skew any potential results. I have that marketing and market research background. So, you know, very important. <laughs> That's awesome. Thanks, Vicki. It, it doesn't seem like a trick to me. And it's great to see all, <laughs> the, all the responses going like, oh, all, all beetles. And then as more people come in, um, things are kind of uh, evening out. We've got 60 people or 60 percent voted. So if you haven't voted, a couple more uh, seconds to vote and then we'll move on. Great. I think I stopped at 80%. Everyone who voted the first time should vote this time too. Yeah, definitely. Hopefully I haven't lost anybody in the process. <laughs> no, we, we actually got more people um, since we started tuning in. But I think I'm gonna call it there at 70% um, and show you all the results. Excellent, thank you, Mark. Thanks everybody for voting, bees. Bees, and we got, we've got votes for lots of other things, but you are absolutely right, it is bees. And it's not just because of the honeybees. Our 4,000 native US bees are really critical. And if you love, if you love cranberries, chocolate, blueberries, many, many things, almonds, there's so many things that bees are responsible for. 
So thank you very much, Mark, and thank you everybody for voting. That's fabulous. All right. So pollinators matter. Um, and I think you're here today because you know that. Um, but I wanted to share some of the specific stats from the Xerce Society, which is um, the Society for Invertebrate or Insect Conservation. Um, they have a couple of very interesting facts. The pollinators are responsible for 85% of the world's flowering plants. They're responsible for two thirds of the global crop species. So the crops that we grow, not just for us, but also for the animals that we eat are because of pollinators. They are responsible for one out of three bites of food that we eat. So it's not just quantity of food that we eat, but the quality of food that we eat is so much better because we do have the joys of being able to eat nuts and seeds and fruit that we wouldn't have otherwise. And they provide a lot of ecosystem services too. You know, Because of plants, we're harnessing energy from the sun. They are also helping us with soil, um, you, know, you know, conserving water and all kinds of things. From a US agriculture standpoint, they also are responsible for an estimated $3 billion economic impact uh, for US agriculture. So pollinators definitely matter. And they matter because they're also part of the overall ecosystem. They're at the bottom of the food web as insects you know, really it's plants and then insects. Insects take the energy from plants and we move it along the chain. If we don't have insects, then we have an impact on the rest of wildlife from birds to others. So I'd like to share uh, some of the challenges that we have in pollinator conservation since this is the pollinator conservation series. In the state of New Hampshire, we, we have a butterfly, the state butterfly that is endangered federally, the Carner Blue butterfly. That's very sad. We have a bumblebee that used to be in New Hampshire, actually used to be from Maine all along the East Coast into the Midwest, and its range has dropped precipitously. I just checked this tonight and there's been no sightings of it in um, still, you know, in New Hampshire. So it is federally endangered. And this is a nice diagram from uh, one of the future speakers in this New Hampshire Audubon series, Dr. Robert Jajir. And we know that there has been a decrease um, in the number of bee species in New Hampshire. Based on a UNH study, um, Dr. Rehan's lab, um, we know that 14 bee species over time, looking at the data, have definitely decreased their number, their, their sheer numbers and their population sizes have gone down markedly. And what's interesting here is that there were a lot of species they didn't have enough data for and some species that didn't seem to change in terms of population size, which is great. There's also great news in that eight species increased, increased their population in that period of time in that study in the Northeast. But what is fascinating is if you take a closer look at these eight bee species, every single one of them is a generalist, not a specialist. The generalists are the ones that do well when there are habitat losses and habitat issues but the specialists are the ones that we need to worry about. So while we have insect declines um, have been documented around the world, starting with Germany, um, they know the biomass has gone down significantly in Puerto Rico and in other places. We also have documentation that the number of birds has gone down precipitously. Three billion, three billion fewer birds in the last 50 years. You can see the species here on the right, um, some of those that are specialists, for example, the meadow lark that requires a very specific kind of habitat, which is going away. If you look at the second bar of blackbirds, one of my favorites, the red-winged blackbirds, 92 million fewer, 92 million fewer red-winged blackbirds. Why is that? Think about their habitat. It's, it's cattails, it's marshy. Those habitats are going away either by man or by invasive species. We have Phragmites that's not native to here um, coming into those areas and you know diminishing the quality of that habitat and the and there's also the purple loose strife which fortunately we're getting a good handle on but that and the insect decline definitely are related um, there's definitely a relationship in that food web and that ecological connection unfortunately 
So we all know many of the different risks. I love um, this view of it from Nick Dorian. Uh, you can follow him on Instagram or Twitter, Be Searcher. He has um, some, some, a great perspective in this really nice diagram that I'd like to walk through quickly because we can make a difference. I really believe that. And we can, we can do things in our yards, in our landscapes and in our communities, even if we don't have a yard that will help these pollinators and help insects and help the overall biodiversity, the diversity of biological system, you know, biological um, entities. So let's talk first about invasive species. I mentioned the red-winged blackbird and two invasive species in their habitat. This is a problem because they are taking up the space. They are replacing this native species that our insects need to survive. And when that happens, and it happens at, at a rate, there's, you know, these, these invasive plants basically come from another continent, typically. They don't have any native pathogens or predators. There's nothing that's gonna kill them. And they propagate rapidly. A multi-flora rose, for example, will do 500,000 seeds each year that's gonna be in the soil. So it's really important if you have, learn what the invasive species are in your community and um, put together a plan to try to replace them with plants that have an ecological function that will serve and support the biodiversity in your landscape and in your community. And it is so rewarding to do that. There are so many examples of people with very small yards, even balconies, that have been able to physically see a huge difference when they do that. Um, Doug Tallamy, an expert in this area, talks about um, a pathway in Brooklyn, New York, where he saw butterflies, monarch butterflies and others. There's a woman in Cambridge, Massachusetts, who has a postage stamp yard, who has cataloged 92 species of different birds in her yard, including um, many different migratory warblers and water birds because of what she has done in that small space. Light pollution is a problem for moths. And remember moths are kind of the underappreciated pollinator because they're at night and we don't see them. They get very confused and they end up being picked off very easily in the morning by birds and other predators because they're, you know, they're stuck there by the, you know, on, on the, by the light. So turn off your exterior lights. And if you're concerned about safety, use motion sensitive site, uh, lights. Use lights that are dimmer, use LED lights so it doesn't cost as much. Um, change to a yellow light, which is more friendly to moths and bats. And by the way, exterior lights are a problem for migrating birds as well. If you're in the bird community, you know there is a call for us to have our cities go dark um, during the times that our birds are migrating because they're also getting confused with this light pollution. Let's talk about lawns. Um, reducing your lawn is one of the easiest and fastest things you can do to make a difference to increase um, the amount of life and biodiversity um, in your yard, um, in your community. So what does that mean? There's many different ways you can do this. You can mow at a higher level. You can leave part of the lawn unmowed. You can stop mowing underneath the trees so the caterpillars that fall down don't get crunched by the mower. I was, um, I was at a property visit today um, with a neighbor looking at her yard and she said she couldn't believe the difference in just mulching the grass when her husband cut it. So instead of cutting the, the grass and raking up the, you know, the bits of grass that were cut, literally adding a mulching blade to the bottom of the lawnmower, which we've done too, increases the, um, the organic matter and the quality of the soil. So you can do that. You can change parts of the lawn by adding a tree or adding you know, a, a shrub or adding a little perennial bed. So there's lots of ways you can do it. And reducing your lawn by half is the goal. That's the goal. If you are using any kind of chemicals, strongly encourage you to consider um, not doing that. You may have a target species in mind that you want to get rid of, but it will have an impact on those that you want to keep. If you are putting chemicals on your lawn to get rid of dandelions, like the herbicides, or you're using chemicals to get rid of mosquitoes, um, you're likely affecting not just um, the firefly larvae that are in your lawn. Um, if you wanna see fireflies, don't use chemicals, but you're also gonna affect the amphibians. 
Our lawn, we mow at four inches and I would recommend mowing higher because it creates a little ecosystem, you know, under, underneath that it's actually, it's better for the grass, but underneath that you have a little mini ecosystem and an environment in which during the heat of the summer, we have found both spring peepers and wood frogs in our lawn, you know, at that lower level, because again, we're mowing at four inches. So there's a lot more we can tell. We can do a whole presentation on lawns. So let me move on to a really important one, which we're, I think we're all doing in some way, which is providing flowers and forage, things for, you know, these pollinators to eat and nesting habitat. Flowers for forage, um, Diane asked the question earlier about what kinds of things. Two really important principles to keep in mind. Number one, bees and pollinators are not going to fly as far as we walk or drive. You know, the area that they that they are living in is much smaller. So they need forage. They need to have a section that's big enough that they can, you know, get the pollen and nectar they need. So UNH talks about doing a four foot by four foot area of the same kind of flower. So that if you are attracting a certain type of pollinator, they can stay there and they can, you know, basically um, fill up in that one spot, which is very energy efficient for them. The second concept with flowers is to think about providing and, and really important to provide flowers for each season, each growing season. So in the spring, I have pictured here, red maple. Red maple and willow are very important as a source for early bees in our landscape, all right? As well as some of the spring ephemerals. In the summer, you can plant all kinds of milkweed um, and many other flowers as well. And in the fall, it's important to think about things that are gonna provide food for the bees that are out then because all the bees have different times. And there's, there's data that actually shows you when different types of bees are out. Like I mentioned, some of my bees don't come out until June, but other of my ground nesting bees are out now and they're gonna be done probably by the time the other ones start, get, start going. So definitely goldenrod and asters are native to New England. They're critical as fuel for the monarch butterflies that are flying south when they're migrating. And they're also important for other pollinators too. So three seasons of interest and try to bunch more than one plant, multiple plants together in a group and you're gonna provide a great, uh, great forage. But there's something that we don't do and I'm guilty of this until recently, and that is provide habitat in terms of shelter and nesting areas. So shelter is critical. I mean, we all need shelter from the elements, predators, um, whatever. This is a moth. Moths are drab, right? So this is a moth taking shelter basically in, in leaf litter. Leaves are really important to leave um, in, in some part of your yard for a lot of reasons for pollinators at different times of the year, they will use the leaf litter. Um, and some of our pollinators overwinter as adults, think of the morning cloak, it comes out, comes out in early spring because it's overwintered as an adult. <laughs> or it could be an egg or a larva or a pupa. Here's a pupa. This is probably a moth. We don't know what kind of moth it is, but I found it in the soil. And basically soil, you know, soil and leaf litter will hold an awful lot of pollinators and provide them shelter and nesting habitat. You've also got nests in logs and standing dead trees, areas of bare soil that are not compacted. And lastly, I mentioned the perennial stems. So if you're leaving up your perennials, you are providing habitat that is gonna be a nesting area for many of these different types of pollinators. You're gonna see a lot more in your yard. You're gonna see a lot more birds in your yard because you have the pollinators in your yard. It's all part of the web. I wanna share some ways to learn more. I've mentioned a few already, but you really should sign up for some or all of these upcoming webinars. Um, two on bees, two on moths, and one on wasps. These are experts who are gonna be able to give you great information. They're going to be able to answer all of your questions. And then lastly, I'd like to share that I'm going to be donating one of these books um, and giving it as part of a drawing to one of you in the audience. Um, New Hampshire Audubon through Mark Nutter will be sending you an email following the event and it will ask you to provide feedback. In fact, I'm sure he'll provide the link tonight in the chat. If you fill out that survey, you will be automatically entered in to win 
um, enter into the drawing and New Hampshire Audubon will pick one of you to be the winner. And then you can pick one of these three books. Two of them are great books on bees and pollinators and the native plants for them by Heather Holm. And the other one is the third book by Doug Tallamy, who is an expert in this area. So with that, I'd like to thank you for doing your part to support pollinators and help them to thrive and not just survive, but thrive. And um, invite you to please take down my email. Feel free to contact me. I am a volunteer. I do this um, because I, I love it. I love sharing it with people. I'm happy to answer questions or give you a resource that you can find an answer. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it back to Mark and Diane so uh, we can take some questions. Thank you very much. Thanks, Vicki, that was great. Um, there was a, sp a question specifically about what willows you might suggest. Um, okay, so I apologize. I don't have species of willows to recommend. There are some that are native and some that are not. A good resource to check is through your native, um, whatever your native plant society is. If you're in New England, our native plant society is the Native Plant Trust based out of Massachusetts. They are awesome. There's also Grow Native Mass, um, but they have resources um, on Native Plant Trust. There's something called Go Botany, and it's my go-to resource for identifying natives. And when I go to the nursery, I always have it on my phone. It's like, nope, that's not native to New Hampshire. I'm not buying that one. <laughs> That's a great idea. So um, Kathleen shared that she's been seeing bumblebees hovering close to the ground and was wondering what they were doing. Mm. That's great. That's a great observation, Kathleen. I love seeing that. Um, if it was a few weeks ago, they might've been the queens and they are looking for a place to put their nest if they're queens. Um, they are usually using rodent burrows um, or sometimes they will you know, find another thing, but they often will use an unoccupied or unused rodent burrow. And they will go down between one and four feet below the ground. And they will basically create you know, area down there where they will provision their little cups, which are much, bumblebees are social and they do have a few hundred individuals. The cups are definitely not, pollen pots are definitely not as neat as a honeybee hive. They're quite interesting. So that would be the case if it's a queen bumblebee. If you're seeing that happen now, um, my guess would be that, um, I'm not sure if the males are out, but males will often you know, wait around for females, many species, um, birds too, but they'll wait for them and then try to mate with them. So it could be a male who's looking for a female, or it could be that female who's still looking for you know, a, a location and a, and, a, and a place for a nest. And Kathleen chairs, it was probably a couple of weeks ago. Then it probably was a queen. Um, as they're going about their business, trying to find the best place for them to provision their, their, their hive, their nest. There are many, many comments to thank you, Vicki, for such a great program. And Mark and I would like to thank you as well. This was really wonderful. You're welcome. Again, you know, I'm not an expert, but I am a homeowner like you. I'm a naturalist and we can learn so much just by watching what's in our gardens and um, watching animal behavior. I get surprised every single day. And last summer I had a thing where every morning I would go out before it got too hot and try to find a new bug. I literally would just like, you know, go to a plant, sit down and look at it until I found something new and then put it in I naturalist, to, you know, or key it out with one of my insect um, field guides because I still use those and try to figure out what it is. And it's, it's so fun. It's such a fun thing. So I really enjoy it. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, Vicky. That's good to hear that you're doing a very similar exercise uh, as what we instruct with our environmental education, which is a sit spot. It's just mm -hmm. to sit down mm -hmm. and observe and learn what you can um, see right in front of you. Um, we did get one more question about, uh, again, which are the social bees and wasps? Mm, uh, okay. Yeah, that's a good question. So um, as I mentioned, most of the bees and wasps are solitary. So you, because they're not defending a big nest, they're less likely to be aggressive or be defensive and thereby attack you. 
The social wasps um, that are our biggest problem are the yellow jackets and they're closely related black jackets, um, which we discovered hiking once, but you don't usually see them in your yard. We found them in the woods. And then um, the bald faced hornets um, are another type of wasp. Um, they have that, that white face and they do that big paper that that big paper nest hanging in the tree that just gets bigger and bigger and bigger as the season goes on. Those are the two social ones that you know really have to worry about. There's probably some others, but those are the ones you're likely to encounter. And then on the bee side, honeybees are social, bumblebees are social, mm -hmm. um, and the rest of the bees, um, I believe, are solitary. There's probably some exceptions. Um, they might be considered eusocial or aggregate, as I mentioned. They they may use the same opening, the same cavity to get into their burrow or to their, their, their tunnel, if you will, um, but they are still solitary in terms of, it is just that female, that mom is just busy provisioning the eggs that she's laying and bringing in the pollen and defending it and then sealing it off, um, you know, to, to try to create the new generation. That's awesome. Thank you, Vicki. And thank you all who are watching for your interest in our Exploring Connections series hosted by New Hampshire Audubon and supported by New Hampshire Humanities. Um, like Vicki said, I'll be sending out a link to the evaluation um, as well as a recording to this webinar at the end of next week. Uh, but I'll put the link um, to that survey again right in there in the chat um, for you to, um, to fill out. And we thank you for that feedback, not only um, for the carrot at the end of the stick, which is Vicki's donation of a book, uh, but it also helps us navigate these types of talks. Um, and it's also really helpful in reporting back to our grant funder. Um, and like Vicki mentioned, our upcoming talks are focused on pollinators. This month will be, or next month rather, will be every Tuesday evening throughout June. Um, so please visit our website um, to register for those upcoming talks. Um, finally, thank you again, Vicki, for presenting. It was an awesome um, talk. Thank you, Diane, for organiza organizing this entire series. And thank you all for tuning in and learning alongside one another. We look forward to seeing you again at a webinar in the near future. And uh, lastly, for ways to get involved as a member, volunteer, or donor, just visit us at nhaudubon.org. Um, thanks, and have a great night. Thank you, Mark. Thanks, Diane. Thanks, everyone. Enjoy the summer, watch all those bugs. <laughs>